Thanks, and thanks to Evidence 2011 for um, asking me to speak, because as you'll see, we're a little bit off-piste from the rest of the programme, without doubt. Um, I put our learning objectives up, because as Derek said, we were supposed to create them when we um, had the talks, and I've noticed everybody else so far has avoided them, apart from Derek, and I wish now I'd avoided ours, because when I look at this, I um, can see um, just these words in bold, and actually what I've written is learning objectives is actually what we're trying to do from the centre, there's massive challenges out there. We have a lot of limitations in veterinary medicine, and we need to look at clinical decision-making within our field. I'm here because I... Um, I think I'm here because I direct the Centre of Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine at the University of Nottingham, and um, we're very new. Unfortunately, we don't have years of research. We had our one-year anniversary this year, and um, Carl Hennigan spoke, which I think is why I'm now standing here, because he did it for us, so I'm doing it for him. Um, and... So that's the reason I'm here. I'd be interested to see why people in the room are here. You might just be a, a bored, polite dentist that's staying for the second half. But can I just ask how many people actually own a pet or a farm or have ridden a horse in the last three months, six months? Okay, yeah. We have about 50% um, animal owners or carers. And as you'll see, you have a role um, in evidence-based veterinary medicine because we can't do it without you. And I'll come to that in a second. First of all, I want to give you a potted history of evidence-based veterinary medicine. It won't take long. I think it's about four, uh, three slides maximum here. We started talking about it in terms of letters to various veterinary journals and in certain um, conferences and forums in the mid-90s. Um, but then it seemed to disappear and go quiet again for a while. But in 2004, this book was published by Peter Cockcroft and Mark Holmes about the principles of evidence-based medicine and how they could maybe be integrated into the veterinary field. And it still remains the only real evidence-based textbook that we have, and it is quite theoretical. 2004 was a bit of an active year in evidence-based veterinary medicine because in the spring of that year, a group of veterinarians met at Mississippi State University to hold a conference about evidence-based principles. And the following October, the Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine Association was formed, um, and they are still in action, and every couple of years they have a conference. We are a small and bijou, but very enthusiastic group that hopefully is growing. Sometimes in the veterinary literature, um, we see a focus um, on evidence-based veterinary medicine, and this is an interesting publication, the Vet Clinics of North America, and this is a small animal component of it, which is um, a series of review articles generally, um, sometimes there's primary science um, published there, and they had this um, publication in 2007 with a focus on evidence-based veterinary medicine. And that's about it, really, that's actually out there um, in publication and in print. Um, as I said, we're based at the University of Nottingham. We work at the School of Veterinary Medicine and Science. Um, myself and my deputy, Marnie, we hold academic positions within the vet school. And this is actually the first vet school that's been developed for the past 50 years. Um, we're very, very new. Our first graduates went out this summer, and so far, okay. They're doing all right, as far as I can understand. But this was a golden opportunity for our profession, I think, to do something different. And when the school was developed, we wanted to do things different on the clinics, in the way we taught, but we also wanted to have a different approach to research. And within our research, we wanted to stick with the school-wide philosophy that we wanted to work closely with the profession. We wanted to be able to integrate our work, whether it be our teaching, our clinical work, or our research, with the general practitioner out there that's treating and treating animals. At a similar time, Novartis Animal Health decided that they wanted to become involved with the new vet school and develop a working relationship right from the very start. And some of the money that went to the school got ring-fenced for an idea that started to develop around evidence-based veterinary medicine. And why not? The University of Nottingham has a reputation in evidence-based healthcare, if healthcare is the right term. I'm never quite sure in a, in a group of um, healthcare professionals of the right term. We have the Centre of Evidence-Based Dermatology. Um, we have the um, Schizophrenia Cochrane Group. We have in nursing and midwifery and physio the Joanna Briggs Institute. So already people were doing it across the medical school and the nursing school. So really the question of the people that were developing the vet school and developing the research initiative said, why not in veterinary medicine? And the Centre for Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine was born. Moni and I have been in post not quite three years yet. We launched ourselves about 18 months ago. At that point, it was still two of us, this beautiful logo and a strap line. Um, 
two and a half years in, we have a much bigger team. And what I'm going to do is explain some of the work that we do and how it fits around what you do in human healthcare, the ideas we've nicked, and maybe some of the things that we can learn from each other. So, of course, we need a definition for evidence-based veterinary medicine. And like most of our other great ideas, you'll see that we've um, stolen it. And so this is an adaption from a definition that Strauss used, that evidence-based veterinary medicine is the use of the best relevant evidence in conjunction with clinical expertise to make the best possible decision about a patient. I'm sure that's very familiar to all of you. We also follow it with the usual caveat, but we've had to adapt it because of our situation, that we also need to think about the circumstances of each patient and the circumstances and value of the owner and carer that come with those, that patient or patients. And we must consider what they think and the circumstances that they're in before we can make a true evidence-based decision. So we found ourselves a definition, that's stage two after a logo and a strap line. Um, what is it that we then need to do? Some words that jump out. We need to look at our evidence. We need to understand clinical expertise and what vets do each and every day. We need to have an understanding of the kind of decisions they make and how they make them. And we need to look at our patients. I'm going to come back to that. Equally, we have something that's a little bit different from you. Um, we need to think about our patients, their circumstances, and their owners and their carers. I'm just going to elaborate on that bit a little bit. If we're looking at patient-centered care or clinical decision-making, we actually have three parts to that. We have the vet, we have the patient, and we have the owner or owners. This actually isn't an owner. This is a veterinary colleague of mine um, dressed up as what's classically known as a mad cat lady. Um, as a feline medicine specialist, I deal with them a lot, and they can be a challenge. They can also be great fun, and they can also be fabulous owners. But our owners, um, as I'm going to explain in a minute, can be very, very different. But we have this triangle. Our patients can't talk. Only Dr. Doolittle could talk to the animals. We like to think sometimes we know what they're thinking and feeling. We certainly generally know when we're about to be bitten or kicked. But they can't actually tell us what's going on. You have a definite advantage of, over us in that way. We tend to do it through a proxy, or I like to think in association with the um, carer or client or owner of that animal. And people have likened it to pediatrics or neonatal health care. I've had some really interesting conversations in that way. But probably people think differently about their pet rabbit than they do about their six-month-old baby boy. Um, some people possibly don't. But it is similar, but it's different. And our patients are different as well. Our patients come in all shapes and sizes, ages, colours and numbers. It could be a probably about three-month-old puppy to getting on geriatric cats that mostly live indoors. It could be a herd of beef cows. It could be three million broiler chickens all in one place. Thankfully, I don't see these, but it could also be a tree frog um, or it could be somebody's pet rabbit. The faces of our patients are very different. Their circumstances and the kind of owner and carer relationship they have can also be very different. The circumstances from a high-level producing dairy cow that lives in a herd of 350, owned by a farmer that wants to produce milk of top quality, is a very different situation for the animal, and also there's different values there for that owner. Similarly, an external organic pig farm. What, what that owner and carer wants from those animals and from, one, from you as a veterinarian is very different from the farm above. On the small animal side of things, um, the way people feel about their pets um, is remarkable and should be applauded. And certainly, if you're a dog, particularly a rescue dog, is the, at least the, the white one here is, belongs to one of our postdocs, if they have a caring owner that they live with, it's probably one of their best situations. Very frequently, and I'll talk about this again, is that a lot of these cats and dogs actually don't have an owner per se. They are the wards of a charity, and the circumstances of those individuals and the decision-making that the owners and carers of those animals have to make are very different from the one-owner, two-pet option that we've got above. And, of course, we've got variety in vets. I'm sure you have variety in doctors, nurses, um, all of the dentists, everybody. We have a completely different career structure to you. Okay. Um, generally, once you leave vet school, after five years, you're out there. If you choose to get, carry on and do more postgraduate qualifications, you can. There is a recommendation that you do 35 hours a, a year of CPD by the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, but there is no set per se um, postgraduate qualifications. This is one of our colleagues, John. Guess which species he deals with? Um, he is a specialist in the field of farm animal medicine. 
Um, so some of our clinicians are highly qualified in one sphere. You give him a cat, he absolutely panics, okay? Cows is what he does, and he does it to a superb level. Some of our clinicians aren't quite so skilled. This is my deputy, by the way. <laughs> this isn't an actually real life, well, she is a real life veterinary surgeon, but she quite clearly realizes what she's doing here. Um, but the variation we have across the profession is huge. And then, of course, we have the old farts as well. This is actually Malcolm, who's the deputy head of school at the vet school. And he, I, I said, look old and grumpy and archaic. And he did this so beautifully, his agent said I could use it at all opportunities. But we meet resistance, um, just as Derek was talking about in the dental field. We do have decision makers that are happy making the decisions that they have in the way they have done for years on years. But within our profession, whatever people think, and whatever the way we are, we have come on um, significantly since the days of um, James Herriot, which you can see I quite clearly nicked off the internet. Um, James Herriot is the reason why lots of us became vets in the first place. He's probably still the most famous vet out there, but we don't do things like that anymore. We don't mix medicines in Siegfried Cellar in big brown bottles. We have moved on. I don't know whether anybody's familiar with the bionic vet. I'm um, Noel Fitzpatrick, who works... Um, sort of in the south of England. Um, what he's got here is one of his patients with bilateral prosthesis for its, back, for its back legs. You may have also seen super vets. We have featured a lot in television over the last few years, and um, super vets came out of the Royal Veterinary College showing the kind of referral work that they do there. I'm not saying all practices like the people on the, the right. There may still be some practices that are people on the left, but things are definitely moving forward. And the question is, is how do we implement and put evidence-based principles as part of that. So that's our challenge. And we have some limitations. I've already pointed some of those out. And we need lots of different types of clinical decisions to be made to be able to function as a profession. So what we've done at the Centre of Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine over the last two and a half years is do a lot of thinking, talking, visiting, stealing of ideas, adapting of ideas um, to work out where we should focus our research. And these are the four basic areas in which we do research at the moment at Nottingham. And they're based around those words that I highlighted in our definition. We obviously need to think about our evidence, and we need to look at existing evidence through methods of evidence synthesis and systematic review, as well as, well as generate new evidence in areas that um, are severely lacking. We need to look at our clinicians, and through practice-based research, and to an extent our population research, and through education and information exchange, we'll start to understand our clinicians better. We also need to look at the decisions that they make, and again, through our practice-based research, we're starting to have a look at the types of decisions vets are expected to make. And we need to have an idea of which patients we're interested in and what we're looking at. Our strapline is putting research into practice, and. Um, as Derek's already highlighted, one of the most important aspects of this is getting clinicians to use the research as best as they can. And certainly we see our role as the centre as a bridge, um, hopefully, that will help um, researchers and clinicians work more closely together within our profession. So I'm just going to briefly go through these. I'm happy to answer questions at the end um, as well about um, more detail to do with this. But in terms of population research, who should we study in terms of which animals, which vets, should we do all of them? That's actually quite a big ask. And once we've decided who we should study, what is it about them that we need to know? And as with all good research, you just end up asking more questions than you actually answer. What we decided to do, um, partly because it was my area of interest, but also partly because it was, um, it's an area that's probably most lacking in clinical epidemiology in terms of the animals, was initially focused on the pet population. And within the pet population, it's actually split between the owned and the unowned population. The circumstances for those animals is very different. Potentially, the diseases might be different because of the way they're kept. If you think a bit further, it's more complicated than that, because actually within the owned population, we have both vet visiting and non-vet visiting animals. And to receive evidence-based veterinary medicine as an animal, you actually have to go to the vets in the first place. But an awful lot of our research at the moment is probably based around the vet visiting animals, not the non-vet visiting animals. And they're equally interesting. And there's an interaction between the two. Some people routinely go to their vets. I won't ask all those people that put their hands up in the air. Um, some people go on a very regular basis, have a good relationship with their vets. Some of the time, um, we only see them when things are completely disastrous at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, so there is probably a mixture of owners and the amount of times that they go to the vet. There's also quite clearly a relationship between the unowned and the owned pet population. Um, 
because generally most unowned animals at some point used to have an owner and the ambition for every unowned animal that's sitting in a shelter is to end up with an owner and then they've got a chance of becoming um, belonging to an owner that then actually goes to the vet as well. So it's quite a complex scenario. So where do we start? We start by employing some young enthusiastic scientists that have some experience in the area and these are our two postdoctoral researchers, Jenny and Martin. It's probably quite obvious which one's which. And Martin, who's the big Irish man on the right, um, it's his job to have a look at the owned pet population. And there are some studies out there. And we don't know, but these are the numbers that he texted to me yesterday. The ones that he normally talks about is there's probably 10.3 million cats that are owned in the UK and 10.5 million dogs that are owned in the UK. We're not talking about unowned. But if you look at some of the estimates for cats, which is my love, it sometimes varies from 8 million to 12 million. But there's a lot of them out there. So studies have been done, and what we wanted to do is see whether we can um, improve on those studies to get a more accurate um, idea of the number of animals there or the way of predicting where they might be. Because if we're looking at disease incidents, we're looking at delivering good veterinary care, we kind of need to know where they are, the kind of people that own them, not just the vet visiting ones, but all of the animals. And so we set off on a systematic review. And when you see the title of it, you'll see how young and naive we once were. And um, we're still fairly naive, but we've learned an awful lot in the last um, 12 months that Martin's been with us. But what we wanted to do was examine the methods that have been used previously to estimate um, the size of the own cat and dog population and the biases associated with that. Because we want to have a look and see what people have done before we just go off and do yet another study that won't work for a variety of reasons. It's been a challenge, but I think we're just about getting there. If anybody wants to talk further about this, Marnie, um, my deputy has had more to do with this at the moment. But it's been an interesting learning experience, and um, hopefully in the next six months or so it will be submitted, and we'll see what the journal editors in the veterinary world think of it. So on the unowned point of view, there is no study published about the size of the cat and own, unowned cat and dog population in the UK. So Jenny, our other postdoc, she decided to undertake a census of the charities within the UK. And she managed to generate a list of 2,500 charities that um, shelter cats and dogs within the UK. What we're trying to do is work out what their capacity is, various things about their management policy to find out um, just how large this problem is. We also need to start with our population of vets. We need to get into contact with them. We need to find out what they're doing. We need to find out what they think is important. So Marnie um, led a big survey this time last year. We were about to launch it, which was called the Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine Questionnaire that was distributed to everybody that's registered in the UK on the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons list. And there was lots of different things in there. I'm going to mention it another couple of times. But um, we were basically using it a little bit as advertising and to put us on the map with all of the clinicians. And we gave them a free chocolate and a free pen as well when we posted this out to um, pure bribery. That's what we were after. I got lots of random texts and emails saying, thanks for the chocolate. And I'm thinking, I didn't send you any chocolate, but they really appreciated it. But what we're trying to find out um, is what they think of evidence-based veterinary medicine. Do they even have a clue what it is? Um, where, what kind of journals they read? Where they seek help if they've got problems with a case? Um, what kind of common conditions do they see in practice? What type of work do they do? And we got some responses. I think it's sitting at about 40% or so. And we got some that really didn't like the idea of what we were doing. So here's a limitation. It's probably a familiar barrier that you see. We're apparently offensive and meaningless. Um, thankfully, I think we greeted it with a wry smile because we were sort of expecting it. And we were pleased that people responded positively or negatively. And then a retired member of the profession um, gave us a really positive response and thinks it's something that we should be encouraged and we should carry on. So we definitely have a split field out there when we're talking about implementing these strategies. Okay, so there's our pets and vets. Now how about the practice and what they do? Um, throughout my PhD, I work with practitioners, and most of the vets in the UK work in what we would call general practice. Okay? The minority have those specialist qualifications and work in ridiculous places like I do. The majority are out there in private general practice, working in small businesses, seeing 80% of them work in small animal medicines and surgery, so it would be cats, dogs, rabbits, geckos, whatever, and the other 20% work in probably public health and on the farm side of things and in industry. Um, so basically, they're our coalface. They're the people that see loads of data each and every day. They treat and treat lots of animals, and we've no idea what they're doing. It's a massive source of data, and we need to find ways of harnessing it. So what we did, have done, and it's working. I was at one yesterday, 
um, is develop a network of sentinel practices. We have big plans for these guys. For anonymity, I'm going to give you the worst geography in the world because there's Nottingham, sort of. Um, and the greens are the practices that we're working with at the moment, and I'll talk about one of our PhD um, studies that's going on. The oranges are the ones that have expressed interest, and actually at the moment we have undergraduate projects working in these two up here and those two there as well. We're kind of breaking them in gently with a small four-week project to see whether um, we can actually integrate researchers into practice and get the information out. Natalie, who's one of our PhD students, is actually visiting each of the green practices for one week at a time, observing consultations to see what animals come in through the door, what's wrong with them, and what happens to them. So she collects some fairly basic data. So it's the type of animal, what sex they are, um, whether they're neutered or not, um, the extent of the clinical exam, and the type of um, consult they have, whether it's the first time you've seen the animal for that problem, whether they've been euthanized, whether it's about PrevMed, whether it's about post-operative um, checking, whether it's monitoring for chronic treatment. And then throughout the consult, Nat records um, what happens. So she records the reason for presentation and then what, body, what clinical findings there are, what body systems are affected. And any other problem that ends up with a two-way communication, she records those as well. If we just record the primary reason for the consultation, everything will just look like a vaccination or a diarrhea or a skin or whatever. And there's probably lots of other things that are talked about that vets have to make decisions about that are conditions that affect animals. And what we want to do is have a look at how frequently um, the decision-making goes to test, treat, do nothing, which people talk about in evidence-based principles. But we also need to look at euthanasia and PrevMed, which is some of the things that we do quite frequently as well. So we're interested in the outcome and at what leads to a certain type of outcome. Before a, um, a vet treats, do they have to get an absolute diagnosis or is it syndromic in the way that they treat? She's got some interesting stuff. Most veterinary consultations are 10 minutes. I noticed that my GP surgery now, I'm only allowed to talk about one condition when I go. Even though I have a whole body, I'm only allowed one thing wrong with it. And obviously those things aren't allowed to interact. Um, I don't know how GPs manage that. Um, vets would find it very difficult indeed. This is just pilot data from 190 animals with 432 problems. So you can see that we've probably got um, two and a half-ish problems per animal. But in a 10-minute consultation maximum, and some of these are less than that, you, you can see just from this pilot it goes up to eight problems. We now have one nine-year-old cat that has 10 problems that the, own, that the vet and owner have to have a discussion with, make a decision about, and then move forward. So there's lots of stuff going on. The other important thing is that um, this, again, is the same set of animals with the same set of problems. And the red is if that's the primary reason for being presented. And the blue is the secondary reason or tertiary reason for being presented. And you'll see some things like preventive medicine, which is PrevMed on the far left there, are common reasons for being presented and are talked about. It's also a common thing that's talked about secondarily. There are other things, such as dental disease. People don't open their animals' mouths. You suggest they give a tablet and they, they really don't like that idea. Um, but we do when we do a clinical exam. And certainly dental disease is something that we see an awful lot of in small animal practice. But owners are unaware of it. But vets talk about it. And it's obviously important. You'll see behavior right there out on the far side. Um, veterinary behavior is something that's probably overlooked in the way that we teach and do clinical work. And people don't seem to be certainly from this very initial data. And it goes through with the other data that that's slowly collecting. People don't come to talk about that. But when they're there, they do then talk about it. So again, if we just looked at primary complaint, we would miss out behavior. And it's starting to look like it is a problem for owners and their animals. So that's some of Natalie's work. What we're also doing is um, doing what was mentioned in one of the keynotes earlier, is also trying to get into the computer systems. Unfortunately, across veterinary practices in the UK and in small animal practices, probably about 3,500, there's 20 major practice management software systems, seven of which dominate, and they don't really talk to each other. There are various aspects of the prof profession. The Society of Practicing Veterinary Surgeons are working to try and get the systems to talk to each other, and that will make it far easier for us to extract data. We can't have a PhD student in practice forever. We may have in-house researchers in there forever, um, but we do need to be able to work with the computer systems, and we're working on that. We're also looking at the communication between um, client and vet, and within that we put animal as well. Quite how the animal is involved in the communication in a consultation, we're not sure, but they definitely play a role. And we're also looking at um, a smaller study with a master's student about how, um, what breeders and vets think of each other. 
Um, pedigree dog breeding can be quite controversial and there's a lot of opinionated people in that as well on both sides, the veterinary side and the breeding side and there is concern around pedigree dog health and what we're trying to look at is the relationship between vets and breeders and see if we can look at the areas where the communication breaks down um, so we can hopefully work to improving that and improving the health and welfare of these dogs. So systematic review, I don't really need to talk to you about what that is. I'll just talk about where we've got to and the first thing we need to do is a massive big thank you to all of these people that have helped teach us and our team about the principles of um, systematic review and maybe how we can apply it to the veterinary literature. We also need to thank you, particularly Hal who's in the room for Douglas. Um, he's our information specialist who has, is our newest member of staff who's been here just over six, seven months. And some of you will no doubt know him for the work that he did with the Skin Library, but he's an absolute godsend. We realised quite quickly we needed one. We didn't realise we'd get a fully-fledged, evidence-based, trained one. Um, and he has actually made massive inroads um, with us on the area of systematic review, looking, and f looking at the literature and synthesising it. We have some evidence. We've got quite a lot. It varies in amount, strength and quality. We've got lots of different types of publications, some of them more robust than others. And um, there are some areas of veterinary medicine that we do really commonly, like squeeze dog's anal glands, which is a really glamorous thing to do as a vet. We do it lots of the time, every day. We know no idea the best way of treating that, preventing it. There's no evidence out there. Sometimes we can find quite a lot of evidence on a subject, and often it's quite an obscure disease. We have more, probably, in production animal medicine, so on the farm side of things, than we do in companion animal. Um, but, again, it varies in strength and quality. We also don't know how vets are reading it or how they then use it if they do indeed read it. And again, the survey that Marnie did, um, we did ask which publications they routinely read, and then when they did read a paper, which bits of it would they read? Is it just the abstract and the conclusion, or do they do anything in the middle? Or if they do do anything in the middle, do they then just get scared of it? We also asked them about where they um, source their information from, so not just in terms of journals, but textbooks, expert opinion, um, websites, Wikipedia, whatever. Um, because we don't know... We know the evidence is out there, we can find it to a varying degree, but we don't know how vets then actually use it and how good they are at reading it. So if we're going to present it back to them, we need to put it in a way that they can read, understand and use it. This is Douglas's current project at the moment. We're trying to create a database of systematic reviews because they do exist. Um, this is one of the ones that is in evidence-based veterinary dermatology. I think we've taken an awful lot of hints from um, Howell and his colleagues. So they do exist. Again, the majority of them are in um, food animal science um, or medicine, veterinary medicine. Um, but there are some in small animal. We don't know how many yet. It does appear that over time we are doing more of this. So they didn't really exist in the literature 20 years ago and there's more of them there now. The methods which people use is all over the place. And what we will do at some point when we've collated them all is have some way of looking at the methods people have used and potentially have a go at appraising them. What we do know is that we need systematic reviews about things other than treatment. So we need to understand risk factors for disease, prevalence of disease. So we need to look at methods um, of systematic review that deal with things other than randomised controlled trials. And probably the kind of systematic reviews and the questions that are posed that lead to a systematic review will vary depending on the kind of animal we're talking about. Because again, it's that that's context thing. The context of a pig living with 300 other pigs on an outside organic farm is very different from my two cats at home and the treatment and um, health needs of those individuals. One place where we have made progress, and um, Kevin and Catherine are both here and they've been really helpful, is Best Bets for Vets. If you've not been anywhere near the Best Bets um, website yet, a little advert for Kevin, he's speaking after the break. Um, we went on one of their courses and Marnie and I turned to each other and thought, we can do this. We think we can actually do this. Not to such a great degree, but maybe we can. Because generally bets are based around simple clinical questions where the answer can be directly used by the clinician next to the animal. And we actually use this in our undergraduate teaching, but the plan is to create a database and start publishing them. But we focus on farm animal, which is one of the bottom ones, and small animal as well. And um, even these are a bit of a challenge, to be honest, because just developing a PICO question when you're talking veterinary medicine can be a bit tricksome. Because the P involves a species as well as a problem or a population. So not only do we have to work out things about the disease and the problem, we also have to work out search terms and ways of um, 
some dogs, some studies, dogs is good enough. Sometimes it has to be spayed bitches. Cows sometimes is good enough. Sometimes it needs to be beef calves. So we need to get our PICO questions right to have an answer that can then be used by a clinician. And we spend a lot of time wandering around going, is that a good PICO question? I don't know. Have we covered what we need? The proof will be in the pudding when we start publishing these. We've got a series of focus groups coming up with vets um, to see how they would use these answers. They'll probably mostly argue with them, but that's quite good fun. Our other big question is where, the, where do we go looking for veterinary literature? And our first publication that's going to come out of the centre, hopefully it will be um, submitted this week, is something that Douglas has led. Around best bets, we were saying where is the best place to search to get the papers to answer the best bets. It's not a full systematic review, as Kevin will explain later. And we were using um, Medline. Um, but what we've actually done is the recent work is that actually Cab Abstracts is a really good place to look. Um, it's probably something you're not familiar with if you work in the medical profession, but it's a really good resource of veterinary and agricultural and bioscientific references, which is a, a good wealth of knowledge. And they cover the grey literature as well as the published literature. So we soon found that we thought we knew something about searching until we started this job, um, and now we know an awful lot more. So really, number four is the most important thing, really, is how do we actually get this information out? How do we teach people about it? And this has been a real challenge. Um, I suppose the first thing we did for the first year or so, and thanks to the colleague, colleagues in the room that have helped us, is we needed to educate ourselves, work out what it is we needed to do, and then some of the systems of how to do it. The reason I asked Derek that question is we're grabbing them as young as we possibly can. We're at a new vet school, and when we arrived, there was no clinical curriculum. So this was our golden moment. Final year was approaching, and Marnie and I said, we should do something about that. So in every, every final year, we'll come through a degree of evidence-based teaching twice during their final year, which is a 50-week final year, where every fortnight they change to a different clinical rotation. On one of them, we talk to them about how to read a paper, um, we use various tabloids and newspapers to talk about how things can be reported differently and that scientific literature can be that way and it varies in quality and the evidence behind it can vary as well. We get them to look at different resources they could use to make clinical decisions as a um, young veterinary graduate and this is based around a clinical scenario and the students between them have to decide between textbooks, phoning me up, um, looking on Wikipedia, reading a scientific journal, the best way of answering those questions. So everybody does that. Then what we also do is use best bets um, as a teaching um, framework as well. So twice during final year, our students will go through um, an adapted version of the best bets framework. They'll do it once on small animal, once on farm animal. And if you want to read any more about it, Marnie's got a poster about it, which is number 57 out there somewhere. Um, but it seems to have worked. And if you have a look at the poster, the students seem to like it. And what we've tried to do is make it practical and make it relevant to the rotation that they're on. Our first bit of postgraduate teaching was initially awareness, and I think that's what we're trying to do at the moment. We're just trying to stir up a bit of um, awareness of what evidence-based veterinary medicine can be. Um, Clive Adams at the Cochrane Centre for Schizophrenia said, you just need to go to loads of conferences with a logo and make loads of noise, and you'll soon find the early adopters that want to follow you or want to give it a go. And that's what our sentinel practices are. Hopefully it's what our undergraduate students are because they're going to go out there into the big wide world and we want them to take evidence-based veterinary medicine with them. I was at a sentinel practice yesterday. Often involves taking vets out for pizza and beer, but we talk about um, why practice-based research is important, how valuable they are and how we can engage with them. Marnie and I this year um, have talked a lot at various different national veterinary conferences about how this might apply to the work they do, whether that be vets in the government, practicing veterinary surgeons, small animal specialists. We've just gone out there and made a bit of noise, and it's good to see that people are now coming to us. We've written a few letters. We're getting closer to that um, publication. And we've also developed a website. So there's places that people go, can go to get some of that information. So that's really the four things. And um, I talked about challenges and limitations earlier. And we certainly have a challenge. We have an interesting group of patients in different circumstances that's quite varied. You can apply that to the evidence as well. We also have a wide variety of clinical decision makers out there that may or may not engage with the principles of evidence-based veterinary medicine. But so far, um, the response has been mostly good. 
And we hope as we develop in size and our output gets bigger, we'll start to be able to see how people actually can use some of these principles in veterinary medicine. And we hope, because right from the beginning we've engaged with first opinion practitioners, they will come with us and we will learn from them as much as they will learn from us. So that's me. I'd just like to thank all of the team, the practices, the animal shelters, the animals and owners that we work with, Kevin and Catherine from Best Bets, Hal, who's been a friend of the centre right from the very beginning and is a great mentor for me, um, to Evidence 2011 for uh, asking us to speak, and to Novartis Animal Health for their continued financial support. And I'll happily take any questions. Thank you. Mark Smith from Australia. Um, I do have a, a reason for being here. I'm a dentist and father of a daughter with a PhD in dairy production, so I'm cool. put in each camp. <laughs> um, you qualify. <laughs> I think uh, I'm a bit dismayed in, in a sense that, uh, you know, Derek's alluded to the fact that dentistry is really dragging the chain on evidence and certainly dragging the chain on good quality, um, you know, studies and so on and so forth. And I think... Uh, bet science would probably fi find the same thing, that the challenge now is that we've got patients coming through the door who many times, for better or for worse, know more about the particular illness they come through the door with than you know, the professional they're supposedly seeing. Um, I think medicine is well placed now to answer that challenge because they've got a, a real head of steam up. And perhaps just a collective question to the two of you actually is that, uh, you know, have we left our run a bit late uh, and do we run the risk as professionals of being sort of, you know, swamped by the uh, well-informed um, courtesy of the internet uh, consumer of healthcare? Shall I go first? <coughs> One of the reasons we teach it, because frequently during your consultation evening somebody will come in with a whole load of stuff they've printed off the internet. And one of the reasons we want our students to think about evidence and the strengths and weaknesses of it is so we can help them handle that. Because as a day one graduate, if somebody on the internet appears to know more than you do about a disease you've never heard of, um, that can be really difficult. So that's definitely one of the reasons that we use. I like to think, though, it's not too late. Um, there is massive opportunities for improvement. Our profession has come on a lot in the last 20, 30 years. Um, so no, I don't think it is too late. It's a big task. But I always see it as small bites. We're currently looking at how good the evidence is and if we can, in terms of looking at how many RCTs are out there, how many cohorts, how many case controls and then how good they are and quantifying them. But the feeling would be is that the better quality, higher um, hierarchical studies are increasing in veterinary medicine. So hopefully there will be certain areas where we can direct those consumers to good evidence. Because yes, they come with a lot but we also need to educate our caregivers on what is good and what is bad. Um, we're certainly starting with clinicians and undergraduates to start off with, but some of our work's already starting to broach into the owner-carer situation, um, and hopefully some of our work will be with that because of the fact they deliver an awful lot of our um, care, particularly in terms of preventive medicine, and in veterinary medicine we do an awful lot of preventive medicine. So, um, yes, that's a challenge, but I think we can rise to it and hopefully educate them in the process. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Anne Hilda. I'm from uh, Norway, from the Knowledge Center of Health there. And I wondered, do you face many ethical and political uh, barriers to evidence-based uh, medicine in veterinary practice? Because in Norway, that's a big problem. Uh, it's not uh, every time that uh, we don't know what's the best to do for the animals, uh, but it's the polit uh, politicians, they are uh, so um, closely combined with the agricultural uh, and economical uh, values, uh, so that could be a greater barrier, yeah. actually, than uh, actually to know what's the best yeah. for the animals. It's another thing that adds to the circumstances, particularly of our food production animals, because there is that political pressure or legalities associated with the way that they're managed, and we have to account for that. Um, so certainly on the food production side of things, yes, politics does come into it. I like to think ethics and animal welfare also come into it. The way that we're dealing with animal health and welfare within the UK is being changed again, and then it's a question of whose responsibility is the welfare and whose responsibility is the health. As a veterinary profession, I think we should be involved in both of those things. 
from a small animal point of view, there's always ethical um, implications. P a, a few people have said to me, oh, it must be easy with animals, you don't need consent. Actually, yes, we do. We can't just experiment on anything that moves, and we have veterinary responsibilities too. And getting clients informed to be able to partake in these um, studies is a challenge. Um, and th we're looking forward to the James Lind Association work and looking at maybe how we can use some of their ways of getting people involved in practice-based research. Politics at the moment in this country don't really come into companion animal health because the government as yet don't really quite have that on the radar. Even though to me, I think any small animal vet does far more public health every day um, than we think because people live very closely with their animals and there are good and bad health implications of that. But there, I'd say there's not really much of a political agenda at the moment other than the welfare lobby. But yeah, it, it, add, it adds to the decision making and it can add some limitations, but also it can help us promote the, the problems of animal health. Thank you. Howell Williams, dermatologist from Nottingham. Enjoyed your talk very much, Rachel. Um, I wanted to ask well, you and Derek quickly, uh, clinical medicine is uh, full of examples of doctors doing more harm than good. Uh, and in dermatology, we have lots of rituals and things like that. Knowing what you do now, are there two or three things um, that you think are dubious in, in feline? In, in your own specialty area, Rachel, I mean, uh, I've been taking our cat to the vet for years, and every time we go there, uh, cat always has an injection of antibiotics and, and steroids, regardless of what's wrong with it. I say it facetiously, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I know what's going to happen there. And uh, I, I, so my question to you, Rachel, can you think of two or three things that, knowing what you do now, you think are dubious and perhaps are doing more harm or perhaps are, are wasteful in terms of uh, uh, rituals? And, and perhaps I can ask Derek quickly that question as well. Just boom, 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 if you can, or is it a difficult one? It's difficult because we don't know an awful lot. Yeah. Very quickly, okay. it's difficult because we don't know an awful lot about what vets do, but I've talked to you about it before. The use of antibiotics in lower urinary tract disease in cats is a complete waste of time. We know it. I've done a study that shows vets still do it, even though all the experts and the research would say don't but they carry on doing it. There's a lot of fear around vaccination as well, and actually if you read the studies around the pros and cons of vaccination, they are really, really limited out there in the clinical setting. Um, we've done an awful lot with the preventive measures of, measures of vaccination, and I think we just need to be careful that we don't put people off when we've actually had a massive impact on health and welfare. 